the Within Orb podcast. Come get Within Orb. Hello, my name is Jen Zart, and welcome to Within Orb, a production of the Celestial Arts Education Library, a podcast bringing people together around the love of astrology, books. Join me as I interview people about the astrology books that change their life and practice. You can support the podcast at withinorb.com. Welcome to another episode of Within Orb, and today we're heading out to Prince Edward Island to meet Mark Douglas. Hello, Mark. Welcome to the show. Hey, Jen. Thanks for having me. It's so fun when we're talking across the continent because, you know, right where you're sitting at the time of recording, the sun is setting, and I'm still looking at the sun in the sky where I'm sitting. So it's kind of a an awareness of that curvature of the earth, and I just kind of think that's cool. Yeah, really cool. I had a client from L.A., few weeks ago and uh we had an epic snowstorm so the the spruce trees were just laced with all that kind of beautiful soft soft snow that we get enough of here and um i had to explain to him i said you know look this is very picturesque but uh it doesn't happen like this all the time (laughs) they had like a uh, david lynch moment with you yeah exactly (laughs) very beautiful snow and the swaying trees and okay so we have never met in person we would have met in a pre-pandemic moment, there was an awesome conference in Halifax that I didn't get to go to, but here we are. Yeah, we're here. And um, back then, it was an amazing conference, um, Northern Stars 2019. And I believe I was whistling towards you to come stay in our cottage and I'll tour you around PEI and uh, the whole shebang. But yeah, yeah. nonetheless, come back out when it's nicer weather. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to. I've never been there. So, nuts and bolts, what was your first astrology book? First astrology book was The Illustrated Guide to Astrology, 1990, Wynne Griffin. Does that ring any bells? No, not at all. This is totally new to me. Okay. This is the size of the book, so it's quite... Oh my gosh. The cover... Okay, guys, the screen just blacked out. It's this massive leather-bound book. Looks like leather, at least. Coated cloth. Coated cloth. Literally, my dog ate the cover, so it was a beautiful front cover. <laughs> That's awesome, but sad <laughs> yeah. at the same time. <laughs> it was, funny enough, given to me by my parents, and I was 10, 12 at the most, and they were not astrologers, to put it mildly. Did they know what they were giving you? They did. You know, I, I might have mentioned something. I was trying to figure out why they would have given it to me, but I got it nonetheless, and I probably... Got interested. Um, my aunt's a very prolific astrologer, psychic, and you know, I grew up from a very early age with, you know, she'd be coming over and babysitting or whatever you call it, and uh, with the Celtic ruins bag, and I'd be making dominoes out of them, which you know, you're not supposed to touch somebody's Celtic ruins. <laughs> so I grew up with that, and that would have been part and parcel of it. But this book, it was way over my head. Is it okay if I read a sentence from it? Oh yeah. This was a uh, my young age. I mean, it's probably too big a reading for myself even now. It starts off, as the great scholar Manley Palmer Hall wrote in 1933, the proper end of all learning is to discover cause. Science exists that it may glorify fact and establish truth, yet for certain reasons, entirely beyond scientific control, cause remains unknown. Fact is obscure, and truth only a word. So... So that's cool for me now. And it was pretty heavy stuff. That sent me on a real safari, if you could imagine a 10 or 12-year-old at that point. But the book itself actually dies into some decent history of astrology and does a great job of covering the bases. But uh, more importantly was just the sheer size of it that I showed that I couldn't put on my little bookshelf. So I had to actually sit on my nightstand I didn't do anything with it. I didn't start my diploma in astrology until I was about 36. So if you do the math, it was quite a long period. And because the book wouldn't sit on my bookshelf, I was forced to kind of look at it every day. And um, I just developed this big yearning, which in the Huber Studies program, we work through each other's charts. So students will work through my chart and they clearly see this deep yearning for the ninth house and, and everything else. But basically, it festered in me, and I always wanted to be an astrologer like so many of us do. And because my aunt was such a 
you know, psychic and, and everything. I thought this was just, you know, not something attainable. I didn't think that you could learn astrology. You thought it had to be given to you or, or you know, something. Mm. So this book, um, when I say it's my first astrology book, it when you asked me to kind of qualify that, it kind of blew me away to think of this book because it always held that space for me. So I'm just so glad that it was so big and that it had to stare at me <laughs> and, you know, cause this kind of inner turmoil, if you will, this this beautiful kind of yearning for astrology. Wow. So did you keep it on the nightstand for how many years? I mean, it would have stayed there, you know, five, six years, I guess. I can't help but think there must have been some kind of dream osmosis, like your consciousness was sort of leaving your body and just like getting into the book without you knowing consciously about it. I really think so. The moment I found out that I could study astrology blew me away. And I do connect the dots to this book and and what it held for me. So anyway, thank you for that. Thank you for making that connection for me by so having cool. me my dig in. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. The way you're talking about this book, it is like a person. And I think about this too when people are learning their first kind of astrology. is almost like a little chicken that's like cathecting onto the mother chicken, the hen, you know. It's like, so are you my mommy? Are you my mommies? But you can imprint it with any other animal, right? So it's sort of like your first astrology book becomes this kind of imprint of the kind of astrology you might pursue, at least at first, right? And so there's a strong emotional relationship to that. I suppose that could be true in any field, but we're talking about astrology, so... <laughs> We're talking about astrology and, um, you know, it hits us as astrologers, right? We we have captive moments with our books and I like that word. They become something. They become people. We relate to them, right? We walk past them and they might get picked up a little bit more than, than other books at times. So Yeah, well, I mean, also the power of astrology to heal. I mean, because you're primarily a healer who uses astrology too. Would you say that? I'd say... It's funny. I love that word healing. Love to think that. I, I stay within coaching and within facilitating um, and wouldn't we love to heal? So yeah, I don't want to shy away from that. But definitely I would say maybe 90% of what I do is just showing up, hopefully giving um, clients a bit of a blank canvas to paint upon with decent amount of humility. So if that places me in the realm of healing, then all for the better, I guess. Sure. Working with tools of healing. But these books, sometimes, you know, I think when we're younger or when we're new to astrology, it doesn't matter about your age, and you read something that's quote unquote true about your chart, although, you know, keeping what you read in that first astrology book about truth in mind, and then it, it is a moment of reflection or healing or sort of like, oh my gosh, how did they know that? this book knows this thing about me. Ah, it feels so weird to be seen or like there's some kind of truth there inside of the reflection of the text. And you're like, this was written so long ago. How do they know this about me? Yeah. Mine twists from early ages that we, we shape into. It's yeah. The loveliest adventure I've ever been on. Absolutely. Okay. So you brought up the word adventure. Now it's time. <laughs> okay, <very laughs> It's good. time for the big three. Okay. So if you have an ephemeris, and one bag, and you're being shipped off to the desert island, what are the three books you'd put in your bag? I have a lot of earth in my chart, so I'm going to stick with John Frawley's The Horary Textbook for practical reasons. Probably maybe get me off the island or know when the rescue ship is coming. <laughs> and also, I just find it really fascinating. The other ones would be the Huber Diploma book that I was really great to see them publish their diploma course into a full Full rich book. Then lastly, Dr. Becca Tarnas's upcoming book, and you will know more about this than I would, maybe the the soul of the cosmos that I noticed she was finishing up, perhaps getting published. And the reason I say that is because I'm a Gemini and it's the book I haven't read yet. <laughs> and I realize that I align with what Dr. Tarnas is after. So I think that book would just be exciting and give me a chance to really poke around with this new iteration of her publication. All right. So let's go from the back to the front. So sticking with Becca, uh, you're the first person who would take a Becca Tarnas book with you. A lot of people want to take Cosmos and Psyche because that's sort of the gauntlet. So I'm wondering if this is about to sort of throw down another gauntlet, Tarnesian mm. gauntlet. I know that she's working on biography of Stanislav Grof. Is this that or is it something else? It's something else. It's on the list. It was supposed to be, uh, I think, finalized 2023. So 
but I noticed it because I was just as we do our thing, kind of looking around for new books. And yeah, it just spoke the soul of the cosmos and finding God in everyone and everything and that divinity nature really spoke to me. So that would definitely end up in my, hopefully I would have a suitcase on this island. It would definitely end, end up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Huber method, that seems like something that is more popular outside of the United States. Can we talk about that for a bit? Because you said the Huber Diploma. I know that Bruno and Louise Huber published a lot of different books, but what you're talking about is one I haven't heard of yet because I think it might be new. Might be new, yes. Okay. I'm holding up a decently sized Indigo book, and it says on the front, Astrological Psychology, the Huber Method. Yeah, you know, funny enough, we in the same room together, and one of the questions I had even five years ago was going to be, Dr. Zarsh, you have studied so much relating to German astrologers with the Hubers and their lineage and Louisa being uh, German and everything else. I thought I'd run that by you because there's still Huber Institutes in Germany, uh, a lot of the translations. But yeah, I noticed that as well, too. There, Essentially, I was Googling around because I was told, well, you should study astrology, my, my aunt, the astrologer, and I was interested in psychology, so I kind of put the two together. And um, what happened was the English Huber School translated the material and came up with their own English program. And then the diploma, and it was a member of the APAI, the Association of Professional Astrologers International, so you could graduate with a full diploma be able to join that organization. And um, for a long time, the school ran for about 30 years. They just had, you know, the paper copies and the PDFs, what have you. But as it was dissolving, just because as schools do, it was 30 years, it ran its course. They published a lot of books that they decided to print this. And it's the full diploma right from start to finish. And you could self-study or work with students or what have you. But what I love about it was it's really well written. I think it's very clearly written and concise. And they showed all their work, you know, many schools of astrology, many ways. They're all right. And the Huber is another version of that being right. And they showed all their work. All the work is in the, that book. So you can open up start to finish and agree or disagree. Here are the calculations. Here's the rationale. And I love it for that reason. And they have a lot of a lot of books within Huber, but this one you know, is just to cover off that kind of 88% of what you need out of a book to understand Huber all the way through, through the natal chart. So in Huber, long story short, because Alice Bailey essentially said in the future, we'll be using three charts, you know, the natal chart, something called a moon node chart, which is summation of past lives, shadow persona, and also a house chart. So, um, it even covers off all three of those and age progression and aspect pattern. So, you get a lot, of, a lot of mileage out of one book. That's amazing. So, do they include the life clock method? They do. That's module six. And okay. <laughs> yeah, and you can, you'd actually, all the calculations, even how to work your way through it, it's quite well set out. I mean, as we do, you're going to buy life clock book, right? Obviously. Yeah. But for most of the diploma, really, that, that'll carry you through. I mean, I would recommend all students, you know, buy the extra books. They're not that expensive and you're going to want to have them. But no, you could absolutely still grab this and I think get enough juice to understand age progression, see if it's something that you'd want to work with. So age progression, break that down, because I feel like you can say that and then I might understand something different with the word progression. So... Yeah, great point. Um, I did an ISAR talk on this last year, and so this is 2024, just to kind of <laughs> timestamp this. Age progression is a progression of sorts, if you will. So it's an internal timing system, and at age zero, at the ascendant, the hand of the clock starts moving counterclockwise around. Each house, we use the clock house system. Each house is six years, so six times 12 is 72. And then you keep going around until time uh, moves on for you. And the whole point is that you're working with the natal chart the entire time, which is really cool. Say you had um, a Neptune in the first house at 
just a little bit in, you're going to obviously experience a full conjunction of the archetypal energies of Neptune early on. So you're forming aspects with the hand of the age progression moving around the chart. And it's not predictive at that kind of level of maybe, you know, triplicity rulers. I took your mm -hmm. your workshop. It, it doesn't do that. But what it really does well is when I'm working with clients and uh, I remember I had a coaching client and he was having a lot of girlfriend troubles and they, it was just not going well. And they, he was forced to live with his um, girlfriend at the time because they couldn't afford to live elsewhere because rent's so high and it was just everything, right? And we went through this card I used from the Amsterdam School of Imagery and he picked out of all 66 cards what his sensation was and he he picked this pier of ropes wrapped all around it and it was dark and heavy and constricting. Whoa. And so, of course, I was like, okay, enough is enough. Give me your birth time. I need to know what's going on here because at that point I didn't have it. And um, sure enough, it was a complete direct opposition to Saturn at that moment. So, the age point does a really good job of showing our, our point of consciousness. So, we are we would be experiencing things through that lens. And then we would bring in the studies through the diploma. We would bring in progressions and a bit of transits if you feel the need. But um, that's if you feel the need, that's awesome. So transits for them are also a kind of top level, like spice on top kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't use transits a whole lot. Hey, there's no shame. I mean, <laughs> traditional astrologers also, that's like the last thing you look at. Yeah, that's kind of where I'd fall. I'd rather just, if it needed to know something, I'd rather use horary. Yeah. But that's just me. It's also time stamping myself because I am I think that there's a lot of growth for timing systems that I'll naturally move into. But but I do like using age point and progressions and, and transits, if you will, mm -hmm. in that level. I want to welcome everyone to the Significant Sources Salon. We are honored to have Dr. James Dotson host our Significant Sources Salon, guiding you through the books that have been most impactful in the world of astrology. We have curated several books, which I think will be interesting, books that you might not have picked up yourself because they perhaps seem old or daunting, and we will make them accessible to you. The salon meets for 90 minutes every month with a summer break. For more details, go to www.kaylee.institute. Join today, and we will see you there. So let's circle back to the age point. You said it was opposing Saturn. So as this age point moves through the house, it can make aspects to different things. Makes aspects to all the different planets. Okay. Yeah, without complicating it, there is an age point for the nodal chart as well, but it makes aspects and also it changes signs. So just as a progressed moon would have an effect of, you know, moving into Aries, the age point, let's say moving into Aries will take on that internal kind of relating for ourselves of obviously individuating of spring-like characteristics of cardinal fire, what have you. So if you're dealing with maybe an individual that's uh, natally Piscean or something, then that shift will come in. And um, that's how it generally works. And also just the main, four main cusps, those are going to be thrusts. And within the Hubers, they did a lot of work on this energy curve for traditional astrology to basically look at it as a accidental dignity, really putting it into play using um, within each house, basically there would be through the golden mean, balance points and low points. And uh, it's really cool. This is so cool. Okay, so I will answer your question to me because I never actually answered you. Mm. My experience with the Huber Method comes from Faye Kosser, who came to Washington years ago, I mean, many years ago, and spoke for Kepler's something or another. So she was talking about the life clock method only. And... It was kind of an introduction level thing. And I had heard about it and I'd seen the books, but I hadn't really ever taken any coursework in it. And I and I go back to that. I think it's just not popular in the United States. Yeah. But she was, you know, coming from the Netherlands and you're coming from Canada. And so I think that there's this like maybe more continental and, and or like non-US centric awareness of other kinds of astrology systems being created. And also the 
the ways that astrology and psychology can come together in certain contexts, you know, because I mean, what you're saying, that's actually pretty exciting, especially in application with coaching clients. Like that sounds really cool. Yeah, great point. And I know Faye and I've chat with her. That's a, be a great episode to watch. Um, All right. We got to ask Faye to come in. <laughs> yeah, it works well. Those low points, too. I mean, if we think of all of nature moving through that cardinal thrust and then completion through, you know, summer harvest, what, ha- what have you, into fixed. And then after fixed, of course, we have to dissolve and we have our winter. So, the low point represents that threshold of fixed completing and then moving into mutable change. Um, and then our cycle of being continued around the chart. I mean, it is really fascinating. I, I'd recommend anyone, you know, that wants to, that's studying it for those reasons. It doesn't answer the questions of, you know, is the car I'm buying tomorrow going to be a lemon or not? Which, <laughs> because I'm so practical, I had to study horary for those reasons. And it's not about championing it as the greatest timing system as there are so many others. I just think what it does, it does really, really well. Yeah. Well, and you're making a great point because the question about whether your car is going to be a lemon or not, you know, like not every type of astrology has to answer the same types of questions. Mm -hmm. And I think the mark of becoming professional is to be able to say, oh, this is the tool for this job and this is the tool for that job. And horary won't necessarily help your coaching clients very well. You know, I mean, it can answer those practical questions for them, but you're talking about an emotional reality that isn't necessarily going to be as, maybe it can, but I just feel like the way you're describing the Huber system sounds like it's a better map for that. Yeah, great point. I, yeah, agree 100%. It's what I get challenged with is ensuring that clients is at a professional level get what they ask for. So if they're coming trying to find out if they're going to like their neighbors in the new neighborhood they're moving to, then we should probably look at horary. Yeah. But if they're having a life biography, existential crisis, and trying to r- relate to what's going on in the now at that emotional deep level, then yeah, we probably should use age point. Yeah, yeah. Although you can actually use natal to see about neighbor relationships, don't you think? True. This is why I should have paid more attention in your workshop on <laughs> triplicity rulers and everything. Yeah, I know. I've noticed, you know, wherever, if you have a Mars ruled third house cusp, mm. you know, it, you might find yourself feeling at home when you don't get along with your neighbors very well or you get annoyed by them because Mars is doing its job in that arena, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm sure Horary <laughs> could also be like, no, in this instance, they'll be great. You'll have you'll have a fine time. Yeah. But I also think it's fun, yeah. you know, we we were... When you're thinking about the various types of astrology and then like even remedial methods of like, can I get out of this? Have you seen the energy curve, as you called it, which sounds really awesome too, like the energy curve. Whoa, you know, (laughs) let's surf the energy curve. (laughs) Have you seen that like stack up with other timing systems or, or other like low points, like maybe the Saturn return or other Saturn conjunct natal moon, like other kinds of, I guess those are two transits though. But I'm just guessing like, you know, is it something that, it's like hiding in plain sight. And they the Hubers gave kind of voice to it in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a chart I can send that would, it does marry up things. For example, at the Saturn return, there's at that 29 and a half, just to keep it simple, that the age point is actually migrating at that point from the fifth house into the seriousness of the sixth oh. house. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we lose our fun. And I have a good example, actually, I did for ISAR, and it's actually on my YouTube anyway now. Well, we can link to that in the show somewhere. So if you go to the Within Orb episodes on YouTube, it'll be in those show notes because we can link to it better from there. Perfect. All right. So what's this example? The example actually was um, my brother. So it's a rich story, but I think very impactful. So what was going on was he was going through Saturn Return and... um, he was running for mayor. He was younger than me and he was like, wanted to be this, you know, going for mayor because he he had a good uh, position and great ideas. Also at that period in time, our father was sick and was actually like basically um, dying within about six or seven months. So my brother was torn because he could either run for mayor and at that point he would have had to election day would have been right at that kind of climax point for my father's health. Mm. So he had to make a decision. Do I run for mayor or, you know, do I not and everything else. So 
it held a lot of tension in that Saturn return realm, and also that his age point was conjuncting Pluto at this, what we call a crossing point, which pulls in the nodal chart, natal chart. I excuse the theatrics of technicalities, but it just makes it epic for a short answer. So, conjuncting Pluto, of course, um, you're going to face your prototype at that level, the immovable nature of Pluto. So, we could look ahead and we could see all this unfolding. And this was back in 2018. I said, well, you know, Al, at the end of the day, this is a big moment that you'll never work through again and that the decision you make will be um, profound. So, just take care of yourself and everything else. See what language we use around those types of transitions. And um, he did. He decided to bow out and he actually became, he moved into photography and the arts and there were some other age progressions going on with Venus and what have you. But it was that that process of sobering up through the Saturn return and through the, the Pluto, if you will, and the age point showed that he had to make critical decisions. And yeah. he's, he's actually a really prolific, fantastic uh, photographer now. So, <laughs> wow. yeah, so it was that transition point. That's cool. Good old Pluto and Saturn will keep us honest. All right. So, Horary. Horary, yeah. John Frawley. So you went to the Huber Method first, and then how did you get Horary in your basket? Horary largely came around 2019. I loved Huber, and I, I went and joined some psychosynthesis programs afterwards. And then at that point, I just became aware of Horary and traditional astrology. I said, let's learn some more astrology. What is traditional astrology and everything else? So Horary just seemed to fit really well. Somebody told me Frawley was somebody worth studying under, to put it mildly. So I contacted John Frawley and he accepted me as a student and got his book and the courses. And, you know, I don't have that many books that I read often. So you can see, once again, holding up John Frawley's horary textbook, it's well used. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I just found that it kind of satisfied my earthy nature. I wanted, I needed to see that astrology really worked in that fun horary way, right? Like how cool is horary just to keep it light? So fun, so useful. And to be able to look at a chart, you know, when friends say, am I going to get the job? They told me 14 days, you know, I, I want to know now. And you can say, no, they're going to find out in six days. They absolutely exalt you. And yes, you're getting the job just to get these multi-layered answers. So, it blew me away. I found Frawley's writing style captivating and funny and clear. <laughs> yeah. You know, so the real astrology. I mean, nobody's mentioned the real astrology. No, yeah. The, Rod Suskin did at the okay. very first part of the year. Yeah. Did he? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the magic of horror. I think when people who have that more earthy or logical sensibility about them meet that version of astrology, you know, it's like what? And there's almost this, I'm thinking of a, a roommate I had once who is an anthropologist and, you know, was sort of trying to like poke at me and a little bit skeptical, but curious too. And you're very open-minded and just, you know, what about this? What about this? And they're like, okay, I'm applying for this job and here's <laughs> yeah. the question, you know, and, and they were thinking basically about like what their coworkers were going to be like. Mm -hmm. And the chart was, I can't remember the exact details at the moment, but it was something kind of like, yeah, this is something, you know, your fear is confirmed. This other person has a little bit more power than you in this situation, and you're not necessarily going to like it if you take this job, right? So anyway, then they went into the interview situation, and they get further along in the process, and they're like, how did you know about that person? Like, it was in the chart. I don't I don't have psychic abilities at all. I'm literally just looking at the planets, and they, they're here, and that many degrees away from there, and so, you know, this version of dignity and all of that, so... Yeah, it's pretty wild when you can do that for people. Yeah, it's wild. And I think it's just confirmed what I wanted. Of a, you know, you want to see yourself. You want to see your own humanity explode through the cosmos and know that you're true and here, right? So, just needed that level. And um, surprisingly, you know, I don't use it that much. And how many clients really don't want to know the full truth? And they want, <laughs> There's right? always I mean, that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like let me let me pretend I have free will, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um John was just a lovely tutor, very dedicated, and I took to his writing style, I think was 
probably the answer. And I found that, you know, honestly, 99% of what I need is in that book, even in the weird scenarios of, well, what happens if it's, you know, your brother-in-law applying for the job and it's not you and, and these weird scenarios that I can get in there. And he, he's typically written about it away or given you enough tools to really answer it. So I love derived. What you're talking about there is called derived houses. Derived houses. And I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. So it's like uh, the pet of my cousin's boss <laughs> got lost. When will we find Mitzi? It's like, <laughs> well, turn the chart like this and then like this and like this so we can find the answer. Maybe. Yeah, it'll all work. And, and he, he's just kind of this trusting approach too. He said, it doesn't matter which house system you use. If you, you know, whatever you use, the client will just show up at the appropriate time to make the house cups all all valid. Mm -hmm. So this this real trusting nature that you can get into the chart and and work with it at that kind of real level. Yeah. And I like you say that you don't use Hori very often, but I'm going to guess that when you do, it's like spot on. Sometimes it's better to sort of use it when you need it as mm. opposed to all the time. Because for example, what would you do if the moon hits 15 Libra and you're like, sorry guys, I can't work for the next couple of days. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, we're going to wait. We're going to wait till the moon's out of the Via Combusta, you know, like, and if you know what, where the moon is all the time, you're just kind of like, can't answer those questions today. Or, I mean, what are you doing to someone's fate if you don't look and just tell them, oh, this isn't going to be very good because the moon's in a not nice place right now, you know? Yeah, well said. I agree. Um, I keep a distance from it, use it when I need to. It's humbled me, that's for sure. People say, you must just go with answers all the time, or why don't you have a billion dollars in the bank? I was like, <laughs> I was like, because it's not like, in my chart just, for one thing, but next. <laughs> yeah, it's on my chart. I was like, because whenever I apply for a contract and then I consciously do up a chart to see if I get the contract, the chart says, no, you lazy bugger, get back to work. <laughs> and if I do that for the next three or four contracts, it'll continue to tell me that until I uh -oh. finally get a chart. So you know, I'm not divorced from reality of, it's just simply reading the reality, interrogating reality. I'm not forging a new reality. Yeah. And also, you know, that goes back to the idea of radicality, right? Because when you use it when you need to, there's a radical need. There's a total yeah. rooted desire. And if you could use it all the time, it's maybe not as potent. It's like continuing to cast tarot cards and ask the same question with a different answer and suddenly the cards yeah. are just like stop it <laughs> stop it put me down leave me alone yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> although i will say like there is one instance and this is going back to rod as well because he was a main teacher for me he used to have a show in cape town on the radio called cape talk or he was on a show and it was like the rod suskin segment of cape talk and he would have his app open and when callers would come in with any question of just like, okay, we're going to buy this house or, you know, what's going on with my sweetie. And he would look at the chart and see, based off of the person's question, how to answer the question using horary methods, like yeah. really accurately in that way. Yeah. It was that, that was really cool. To like, if, I mean, you're like doing rapid fire horary, but I mean, the callers are calling in with true questions. Like they really want to know. So I think yeah. in that instance, it does work like, you know, speed horary or something. But he didn't tell them that's what he was doing. No, and, and, and absolutely, I find it fascinating. I mean, there's just so much to learn. And as we know, with William Lilly, you know, he had a lot of his Taurus nature. It didn't, he didn't, he didn't worry about precision at all. And, uh, <laughs> right, like he would just adjust the charts a degree or so or whatever, recycle the paper from the day previous. And he'd always be complaining about the cloud cover outside with his astrolabe. So he'd just be whatever the moon must have moved a degree or so by now. And away <laughs> you go. And he, and the only way to analyze his charts that I've seen, or at least that Frawley taught, was that we have to use his calculations. You can't put them in the computer today and pop them up. At least that's what I've seen anyway. So I found that, yeah, just fascinating. Lily was moving around the chart at that level, similar. Imagine the, the brain power and the trust you would have to have to do that. I find that so fascinating. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't know that he was that wobbly. That's nice. Yeah, um, Frawley made a big point of of having us go in and you know draw out the square charts and leave the actual original math in there, whatever the degrees were, 
because you can't alter the reality of it. And I was like, wow, this is this is a real mind trip. I love it. <laughs> anyway, so it was fun. Very cool. Very fun. Very cool. Okay, so trip to Desert Island is over. Let's send the student who wants to get into astrology on your itinerary for a trip. What books would you tell someone to get into? Most people have a little bit of astrology awareness now, right? We've all got the apps on our phones. I'd either send people to the Cosmic Egg Timer, Joyce Hopewell, Richard Llewellyn, which is a great introduction to Huber astrology. It grabs a hold of it, start to cover really well and give you an idea if it's something you want to study, you know, the whole ethos and everything. And I would push people if they were right for it into uh, John Frawley's real astrology. And I, I say this with conviction because I really think we need to learn humility through astrology. I think it's a great wisdom to have as much humility as possible. And, um, you know, he pulls no punches in that one of his earlier books, right? I think if not one of his first books, I believe that to give real answers to what people are looking for and that kind of earthiness. So I would hope that at some point, all astrologers wanting to get into it would would read that. So they're not we're not led down a a road of um, whatever school they take and whatever astrology they take, that to know that there's real questions needing to be answered, that you can answer them. And not that, you know, for all these methods is the only way, what have you, but just to know that there are really great astrologers out there that can deliver on those meaty, real questions that your clients are going to have. So Very cool. Very cool. Those are awesome entry points. So what are you up to these days and where can people find you? People can find me in my little cabin here in South Rustico, Prince Edward Island. And uh, we're half a kilometer away from the North Shore, tucked in the woods here. I always recommend coming physically to me, even if you're a client from anywhere in the world, because I can serve you tea and coffee and Aww. pine over you if you're here. And it's, it's beautiful. But um, I'm, on the, I'm on the web, the sea within you. So sea as in ocean, so S-E-A the sea within you.com and uh the sea within you is my instagram handle yeah poke around uh, give me a nudge i like to be quite available and accessible try not to do a whole lot of smoke and mirrors what you see is what you get i was i've been told i'm a straight shooter and um and yeah if you have questions around what i can offer astrologically or even in with studies again like please let me know and uh if i can refer you elsewhere because um I think it's very important that you get the right school to study in, also get the right astrological consultation as well, too. So I offer free referrals and and what have you. For sure, for sure. Oh, what a lovely conversation. Thank you for taking time and spending time with us today. Oh, thanks so much, Jen. And it's been amazing watching your institute unfold. I wish you all of the greatest pastures to keep pushing that forward and along towards because um you're gonna continue to move mountains i love it well thanks so much take care bye. bye for now thank you for listening to within orb to learn more about the celestial arts education library or to become a member visit our website at kaylee.institute that's www.caeli.institute if you enjoyed this episode please help spread the word Follow or subscribe to Within Orb in your podcatcher of choice, rate it five stars, or write us a happy review. This helps others find the show. We also want to give a big thanks to the indie band The E-Block for contributing their song Wake Up for our intro and outro music. You can find them at their website, eblockband.com. This is Jen's Art, signing off for now. See you next time.